Thank you all for the opportunity to present today. We have the following disclosures. Echolasia is treated surgically by Heller myotomy, which has a known effect of gastroesophageal reflux. Our research group previously discovered in a randomized controlled trial that the addition of an anterior door fundoplication to the myotomy decreased pathologic gastroesophageal reflux while remaining equally effective in reducing subjective dysphagia at six month follow up. The performance of fundoplication with Heller myotomy has subsequently been supported by several studies and a meta analysis. Despite widespread support for this technique, um, we acknowledge that existing comparisons of Heller myotomy alone versus Heller with door fundoplication are limited in their duration of follow up, as well as the fact that most are non randomized cohorts, which introduce the potential for selection bias. Achalasia is believed to be a progressive disease process despite intervention, so long-term outcomes are essential to understanding how operative intervention impacts these patients. Additionally, emerging endoluminal, endoluminal therapies for achalasia, most notably POEM, do not include an anti-reflex procedure. Hence, we believed it was important to understand how Heller alone versus Heller with an anterior fundoplication impacts long-term outcomes. Thus, our study objective was to obtain long-term follow-up from our previously assembled randomized cohort of patients who underwent Heller alone versus Heller with anterior fundoplication, specifically noting the outcomes of patient-reported dysphagia and gastroesophageal reflux, as well as reinterventions for dysphagia. The study population included those participants who were previously randomized to undergo Heller myotomy alone or Heller with anterior fundoplication at our institution from 2000 through 2004. There were 43 patients in the initial study. The operative procedure consisted of esophageal myotomy with extension onto the gastric cardia. The completeness of myotomy was confirmed by intraoperative endoscopy. Those patients who were randomized to undergo fundoplication had an anterior 180 degree door fundoplication performed. We designed this as a cross-sectional, multimodal study using telephone, mail, and electronic communication to actively engage these participants. We completed two rounds of attempted contact, making up to six attempts to reach each participant. In round two, we augmented this by conducting a public record search to locate those patients whose contact information was out of date. We also obtained electronic medical records at all facilities at which patients reported having undergone any test or intervention for dysphagia in the interval between the index operation and follow-up. We measured dysphagia using the dysphagia score, which was developed for the purposes of the initial randomized controlled trial and measures dysphagia frequency and severity on a 10-point scale. We elected to measure gastroesophageal reflux using the GERD health-related quality of life instrument, which essentially evaluates the symptomatic burden of gastroesophageal reflux. Reinterventions for dysphagia included any operative or endoscopic procedure performed to address difficulty swallowing that occurred in the interval between the index operation and our follow-up. We included both diagnostic and therapeutic interventions which were reported by patients and verified by obtaining relevant electronic medical records. Our sample size was limited to the sample of the original randomized controlled trial and of which we estimated that 75% would be willing to complete our follow-up. Based on this sample, we would be able to detect a difference of two of two points in the mean dysphagia score and three points in the median uh, GERD HRQL score. This is a cohort flow for the patients that we were able to contact. We started with the initial 43 patients. We identified two patients who had died in the interval, both of unrelated causes. We did not contact anyone through electronic messaging. However, by phone and mail, we were able to contact 16 and 18 patients respectively. In our second round, um, with updated information from our public record search, we were able to contact an additional three patients for a total of 27 participants. 
Our study participants were similar in both groups with respect to age, gender, race, and follow-up period with a mean follow-up of just under 12 years. We found that patients' median dysphagia scores were much higher than had been reported in the immediate postoperative period after the initial RCT. At that point, mean scores were essentially zero, and here our Heller alone group had a score of six, Heller plus Dora had a score of three. Of note, these were not statistically different. Likewise, there was no difference in the GERD HRQL score between Heller alone and Heller plus Dora. Five participants in the Heller alone group and six in the Heller plus door group did undergo re-intervention for dysphagia, and notably, the majority of these re-interventions occurred more than five years after the index operation. One patient in each group underwent redo myotomy followed by esophagectomy for refractory dysphagia. We found that even a decade after this operation, the majority, of oper uh, the majority of participants did not eat a regular diet, having difficulty with liquids, solids, or both. We also found that the majority reported regular use of anti-reflux medications. Despite this, nearly all reported that they would have the operation again if placed in a similar circumstance. We conclude that there is no statistically significant difference between patient-reported measures of dysphagia and gastroesophageal reflux symptoms for Heller alone versus Heller plus anterior door fundoplication. A large proportion did undergo reintervention for recurrent dysphagia, and most of these occurred more than five years postoperatively, which highlights the need for long-term follow-up. While most patients did require dietary modifications and anti-reflux medications, nearly all would have the operation again. In terms of study limitations, this study was underpowered, um, which was largely related to the challenge we had in contacting these participants so far out from their operations. That did increase the risk that we would be unable to detect a true difference which might be present. Additionally, we did not include an objective assessment of gastroesophageal reflux. We believe that this significantly increased the number of patients who were willing to participate in the follow-up study. Additionally, we felt that patient-reported measures were highly relevant in terms of counseling our patients long-term. We also acknowledge that there's wide heterogeneity in the measurement tools that are used for dysphagia and gastroesophageal reflux, and that can hinder comparisons between this study and other studies. This is the only long-term follow-up of a randomized cohort comparing Heller alone and Heller plus door fundoplication for achalasia. Given the equivalent long-term outcomes, this implies that myotomy with and without fundoplication can be recommended to patients. This does pro provide theoretical support for endoluminal therapies that do not include fundoplication. However, long-term follow-up will be needed to understand true outcomes from those patients. And finally, the use of patient-reported measures enabled us to conduct long-term and reproducible follow-up. paper frequently. Uh, it was a very nice study, and this was a nice follow-up. Thank you for doing this. Sure. Secondly, I think you're a little unfair to your original project in terms of your outcome measures, as you've already acknowledged. Uh, you don't really know what the incidence of Barrett's esophagus development in the groups were, or peptic strictures, and so forth. So, uh, But thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Steve Meester from the Oregon Clinic. I would just echo that. Be careful about saying it's perfectly fine to do a Heller without a fundoplication, without evidence of damaging reflux. We know long-term the single largest reason for failure of achalasia treatment is reflux disease, either as a consequence of strictures, esophagitis, Barrett's, and so forth. And to not have that data and have a concluding slide that says it's perfectly fine to do either I think is dangerous. Thank you. We definitely appreciate that. Um, obviously, we are limited to patient-reported symptomatic outcomes um, and not objective assessments. Um, the only support that we can provide for this is that um, in present times with the use of proton pump inhibitors, we do find that the incidence of those um, horrible sequelae of gastroesophageal reflux disease are reduced significantly, but definitely agree with your, your comment. 
Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much.